Many thanks to all of you who have joined us virtually today. My name is Tana Lala, and I'm very honored and privileged to welcome you to this special deep dive session on the sidelines of the wider virtual ocean dialogues on nourishing billions. Allow me to begin by first extending my appreciation to our wonderful hosts, the World Economic Forum and the Friends of Ocean Action, who have given us this opportunity to gather some of our closest partners and collaborators to discuss an important connection between the ocean space and the global agricultural research agenda, as well as the sustainable development agenda through fish and aquatic foods. In this session, we will explore the research priorities and opportunities for driving action, investments, and innovations that will make aquatic foods a central piece of the global call to action for a sustainable transformation of the food systems towards healthier diets within the means of the planet's precious resources and towards an inclusive future of shared prosperity for all. Before I introduce you to our distinguished panel members, I'd like to encourage all of you who are following us live today to use the chat box to engage with us by posing questions, posting comments, and sharing your reactions, which we will review and address as much as we can at the end of the panel discussion. We will be taking you today on a virtual ocean voyage from the island of Penang in Malaysia, where I'm sitting, all the way to Silicon Valley in California, where Dr. Jim Lip, um, Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment with Stanford University serves as co-director of the Center for Ocean Solutions. Through his research, writing, and direct engagement with the private and public sector leaders, Jim looks at how to drive large-scale systemic shifts to sustainability. Before joining Stanford in 2014, Jim was the Director General of the World Wildlife Fund International, a leading organization in wildlife conservation and endangered species. Many thanks for joining us today, Jim. It's great. It's great to be here. Next up, in the south coast of France on the Mediterranean Sea, we have Dr. Marco Ferroni, the chair of the System Management Board of the CGIR, which is the world's largest global agricultural innovation network, which works to generate research evidence and innovations to end hunger by 2030 through science to transform food, land and water systems under threat of climate change. Marco is an expert on international agriculture and sustainability issues with a long career in multilateral institutions and government. Prior to joining the CGIR, he held executive and senior advisory positions at the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture, the, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank in Washington, DC. So happy to have you with us today, Marco. Thank you very much, uh, Tana. From the seaport city of Seattle in the west coast of the United States, we are joined today by Dr. Tony Cavalieri, who is the Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Tony's work focuses on agricultural development in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. He has extensive experience in international development and conservation, and has held senior advisory roles at the International Food Policy Research Institute, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the Nature Conservancy. Many thanks for being with us today, Tony. It's a pleasure to join you. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, uh, Dr. Gareth Johnston, the Director General of World Fish, joins us from Penang, Malaysia. World Fish is an international non-for-profit research organization that works to reduce hunger and poverty by improving fisheries and aquaculture. Gareth is a geographer with 25 years of research experience across Africa, Asia, and the Pacific in the areas of natural resource management, small-scale fisheries policy and governance, and institutional development. He's also a member of the Royal Geographical Society and the International Association for the Study of the Commons. Thanks for joining us today, Gareth. It's a pleasure. So let us start today by reflecting on two key figures. We live in a world where nearly 30% of humanity is suffering for hunger and malnutrition, and over 70% of the planet is covered with water. Aquatic foods, or blue foods as some refer to it, represent an essential component of the global food basket to improve nutrition, health, and well-being for people, as well as the sustainability of our planet. Jim, um, you're part of a diverse group of researchers and partners that are working on the global blue foods assessment to complement the earlier widely circulated and slightly controversial Eat Lancet Commission report on food, planet, and health. Can you tell us 
why this piece of research is particularly important, and more importantly, how does it relate to specific actions we must all take to ensure a global food systems transformation toward healthier and sustainable diets? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And it's great to be part of this session and, and to join this panel. Um, the Blue Food Assessment is an idea that emerged from a recognition that while there have been one assessment after another of the global food system, system and of priorities for the future in recent years, um, that they tend to give short shrift to the role of aquatic foods in meeting the challenges that lie ahead. I mean, already aquatic foods are a major source of protein for perhaps 3 billion people. Um, but they have tended to be neglected in food discussions. We tend to focus on agriculture. Um, and so we recognize that it was important actually to pull together the science that helps us understand the challenges and possibilities of aquatic foods and to bring that science into the heart of glo global food uh, dialogues. And that is the genesis of the Blue Food Assessment. Um, it is born out of a recognition that many of, that all of us share, I think, that as the world grows to 10 billion people, and as that increasingly prosperous population looks for growing, uh, translates into a growing demand for animal protein, we're going to have to get more and more of that protein from the sea. Um, already, production of livestock on land can, takes up something like 80% of all the land devoted for agriculture and is, of course, an increasingly important source of greenhouse gas emissions. So we simply can't afford to meet the growing demand for animal protein uh, from those kinds of sources. Um, and clearly the ocean has the potential to be a more sustainable and even healthier source. Um, but there are a lot of devils in the details in the, that word potential. Um, and, and it is those details that really matter and it's those details that are the focus of the assessment. And let me just highlight two examples to, to give you a sense of that. I'm, the first detail, and this is something that both uh, Roz Naylor, who's the co-chair of the Blue Food Assessment and Shakuntala Tilstead from World Fish emphasized on the plenary panel. The first of those is the incredible diversity in this sector. There are something, there are more than 2,000 species of fish that are part of the food system today, either through wild capture or through farming. Um, and the nutritional value of that, of seafood varies hugely across those species. In fact, Shakuntala and colleagues at World Fish have done pioneering work to help us understand that. So there are some small pelagic fish like anchovies and sardines, for example, that have many, that are many times richer in nutrients than tilapia or catfish that are far, commonly farmed. Um, there are indigenous species that are similarly even orders of magnitude greater in some nutrients than commonly farmed fish. Um, but secondly, the environmental impacts of aquatic food production also vary hugely according to how it's produced. So bottom trawlers that destroy habitats, long lines that kill thousands of birds and turtles and other species are much more destructive, of course, than well-managed fisheries using more benign technologies. And similarly in aquaculture, the destruction of coastal mangroves, the intensive use of pesticides and antibiotics to produce shrimp, for example, has huge ecological costs. Most of those can now be avoided or managed, um, but, but if unmanaged, um, are very destructive. So these details of diversity really matter. Um, and I think a second aspect that we need to emphasize is that the choices we make in the food system are fundamentally interconnected. And the result is a lot of trade-offs that we often don't recognize. Um, so one obvious one is that as we intensify agriculture, runoff into coastal ecosystems can destroy fish nurseries and, and the ability to farm. Um, crops we grow on land are used to feed fish fish we harvest from the water is used to feed livestock. Um, and, and in many cases, we're seeing that fisheries that are vitally important to local communities are undermined by foreign fleets who trawl those fisheries to sell to the distant markets. So it's these kinds of challenges, these kinds of details, both the diversity of the system and the many interconnections that we really need to understand if we're gonna be smart about charting a sustainable future for food from the ocean. Um, and so, I mean, our view is that that those that, that that richer context is important both to making good discussions about the future of food, and frankly, also to making good discussions about the future of the ocean. Because too often discussions in an ocean context have been focused narrowly on fisheries management or on sustainable agriculture, 
without recognizing that those issues and those sectors are embedded in a larger food system that very much shapes the pressures that they're under and the opportunities um, that they have. So this is what the Blue Food Assessment is all about. Um, we have assembled a team of, I mean, an extraordinary team, I must say, of, of leading scientists from all over the world, um, several of whom come out of World Fish, um, but also from other sources. It is co-chaired by Roz Naylor of Stanford and Bea Krona of the Stockholm Museum Center. We are building the assessment in partnership with Springer Nature, the publishers of Nature. Um, it is built on eight scientific articles addressing different dimensions of aquatic foods. Um, each of which will be published in the Nature Journal and all of journals and all of which will be pulled together in a final report with a summary for policymakers in time for the UN Food System Summit. And that's the, I, the last thing I, um, I want to mention. This is about pulling together the science. It's about filling the gaps in our understanding of the aquatic food system. But it's also very much about informing and accelerating the changes that need to happen and the policies and practices that need to be adopted if we're going to succeed in making good use of the ocean. Um, for us, the UN Food System Summit is a singular opportunity to bring these worlds together, to bring aquatic foods into the center of global food dialogues. Um, and that's, that's both for the moment it will create where you have heads of state from all over the world coming together to think together about the future of food, um, and therefore for the first time thinking about the whole picture. It's also about the journey from here to the summit and from the summit beyond, right? And um, there are action tracks now being set in motion to prepare the summit, and this science can be part of building those action tracks and making sure that the summit actually leads to change. So that's what we've set out upon, and we're very excited to get started in it and to be working with all of you. Very exciting indeed, and we definitely look forward to sort of the report being sort of coming out. Um, it's also very, very interesting what you say about sort of the interconnectedness of land and water food production systems. And actually, CG, the CJR network, which obviously World Fish is part of, has been sharpening its mission recently to focus more and more on sort of research um, innovations and an integrated approach to food, water, and land systems, as well as, you know, human health. Um, animal and environmental health. Um, so I'm going to go over to Marco. Um, and as we know, over the past 50 years, the CJR, its centers, and the global research programs have played a critical role in shaping the agriculture research agenda, as well as sort of informing the sustainable development agenda. And the CJR uh, research which has made valuable contributions to improving food and nutrition security globally, reducing poverty, but also improving sustainable management of natural resources and ecosystems. Um, so I guess my question to you is that why do we think that it's important to um, adopt this sort of food system sort of thinking and approach to research? And then how can we use science more effectively to guide critical policy and investment decisions? Um, that relates to examining and, and making the most of this um, interconnections between land and water for, 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 for producing food. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to World Fish and to the World Economic Forum for inviting me to this panel. It is a pleasure to be here. And I think that uh, uh, the theme that comes out of your question to me has a lot to do with systems thinking and the need for it, why do we need it? And when we reflect, for example, on the power of ocean and aquaculture-based food to relieve pressure on land-based land -based resources, as Jim has just done, then that is an example of systems thinking. Um, I wanna start, however, with a practical uh, illustration of the need for systems thinking in, in uh, agriculture-related and food, food and nutrition-related research uh, and innovation systems uh, generally. Why do we need systems thinking? We need from a practical perspective, systems thinking, because most real world problems are not unidimensional, they are multidimensional in nature. And therefore, by definition, all actually binding constraints to the achievement of a given objective must be addressed for scalable solutions to become possible. And if that is not done, then one risks providing partial solutions that may look good on paper, that may function under controlled circumstances in the field, such as in the context of pilot projects, but that will most likely not work anymore once uh, the pilot project support is withdrawn. And therefore, for example, if we want to improve aquaculture, 
um, to help diversify diets and the supply of nutrients and food, we can immediately identify a whole system that is made up of a number of interdependent subsystems that need to be understood and addressed. So in the first place, one immediately what comes to mind is that there is a production subsystem where technology and management play key roles, genetics, feed, animal health, biosecurity, for example, coupled with good management that also needs to address post-harvest harvest dimensions and that needs to be underpinned by research that will typically, depending on the nature of the problem, range from blue sky to translational and quote unquote applied. Then there is clearly a business subsystem where investment in physical and soft assets such as the digital architecture of the business come into play. Addressable market potential needs to be assessed. Operators need to be trained. Business strategies need to be defined and aquaculture businesses, large and small, local and global are run. After that, if I spin this line of thinking forward, you can I, you can identify a, a sectoral regulatory subsystem where uh, whether that is established by government or by an industry body, perhaps inspired by ESG standards that defines and helps guarantee compliance with product, work environment and worker safety standards, child labor caveats, minimum wage and worker benefits provisions among other aspects. And that puts relevant monitoring and perhaps product certification systems into place. And finally, there is a broader public policy subsystem where we analyze and would develop public policy recommendations on sustainability, for example, environmental and social, on distributional outcomes, and in general terms, where we would seek to address market and institutional failure that can create discrepancies between private interests and those of society and or the planet at large, and so on. So successful agricultural development endeavors call for coordinated, appropriately sequenced work that is related to all of these subsystems. And I'm not even claiming that my enumeration of subsystems is complete. <laughs> And now, since you mentioned CGIAR, what applies to agriculture applies to everything else we do in CGIAR. As you have mentioned, CGIAR is a large public international ag research system that operates in five impact areas, all of them interdependent, nutrition and food security, poverty reduction, gender equity, environment and regenerative natural resource use, and climate change resilience and mitigation. These impact domains all call for systems thinking. The TEEB Agriculture Accounting Initiative, Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity offers a possible thought orienting or thought organizing framework to think about inter interdependent subsystems for given impact domains. I know that there are competing such conceptual frameworks out there for understanding food, land and water systems. I believe World Fish works a lot with TEEB Ag and for good reasons. Now, CGIAR is an organization that, as you have mentioned, already has a, has a certain age. Um, it celebrates next year its 50th uh, anniversary. And it is undergoing, not because, it's, because of its age, but because of certain other needs that I'll try to explain very briefly, it is undergoing a process of structural reform and why is this so and how is this related to systems thinking, if I can have a minute or two to just uh, say something about that. So the first thing to note is that CGIAR, of which World Fish, as you have mentioned, is an innovative and valued member. You didn't say this, but I am now saying this. Uh, CGIAR possesses existentially important assets that the world needs and no one else has. That's mm -hmm. the good news. The less good news is that in the course of time, we have become perhaps a little fragmented and perhaps a little bit outdated in some and only some of our work methods and in our understanding of the competitive landscape and environment in which we operate. There are many reasons for this, including to some extent, uh, possibly the way some of our funding has materialized over, over time. Now, I mentioned fragmentation, and immediately uh, this raises alarm bells when we're talking about systems, right? Because fragmentation is inimical to systems thinking. Right. It's about operating in non-communicating 
silos and the reform, which is appropriately, therefore appropriately dubbed one CGIAR, is all about bringing work streams together where they should be so brought together. The reform is therefore about creating guidance and incentive mechanisms to allow subsets of the system to work together where this is needed for impact. It is also about positioning ourselves on a continuum of innovation that accepts that impact at scale requires much more than the research goods we may be able to provide. Innovation is never a single event. It is always about combination. And from our perspective, it is about diagnosing problems, being clear about our contribution to the solution of that problem. For example, improved fish genetics, developing that contribution, and then engaging in partnerships with others, both on the research and the delivery side of things to scale the contribution to end users, usually together with other services that are also needed for end users to be able to adopt the solution. We need to become better at internalizing this model. This is the model and World Fish is actually applying it, deploying it very well in, 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 in many respects. We need to internalize the model and make it part of our DNA, part of our culture. And that is what the, that is what the, um, that is what the, the reform that I'm talking about uh, is, is all about. It is interesting to note that in our 50 year history, where we've had major at scale impact having to do, I mean, obviously everybody has heard the, the term green revolution and, and knows how, how, how grain supply was as a result of that uh, suite of technologies in certain parts of the world that were clearly in deficit uh, of, 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 of calories at the time, were, uh, that, that how, how that work was, was able to solve uh, that, that particular problem and in, in some respect address the hunger problem in, in, in lasting ways. But so reflecting on that experience and other experiences over, over the years, I think that we can say that we have had impact in situations where we have had relevant products to offer or solutions of various kinds, which can also um, um, take the form of policy recommendation, recommendations that, that governments would then adopt. Um, so we've had impact where we have had relevant products to offer coupled with a route to the market through partnership. Now, researchers, since we are a research organization in the first place, but we are not a research organization in some vacuum, in some ivory tower, we're supposed to be doing research for development, which means that there, is a, there has to be a link between the research and the, and, and the processes that generate impact on the ground. Researchers understandably and necessarily focus on their research, necessarily. And they may sometimes tend, for this reason, which is understandable, to forget the broader link in terms of the results chain and the route to the impact. That is why I'm saying that we, we, are, in, we are engaged in a very deep internal reflection, a very productive uh, reflection uh, along the lines that I've, been, that I've been talking about to absorb this, uh, this, this concept of innovation and, and again, innovation system into, uh, into the way we, we operate, into the way we are managed, into the way we will be uh, allocating resources in the future and so on. And so that is in a, in, 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 uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, 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 a quick characterization of the um, highly interesting uh, and stimulating re reform process that we're engaged in, which is all driven by the notion and the need for systems thinking. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, that's really interesting. So, and I guess it's probably safe to say that you know, as part of that reform, you know, maybe there's a greater scope and, and sort of attention to be sort of uh, dedicated to aquatic foods, as Jim was sort of pointing out, in terms of that unlocked pot potential that you know it still has. So, with that thought in mind, I'm going to go over to Gareth, who leads World Fish, um, and which you know, World Fish within the CJR Research Network has this special um, mandate that focuses uniquely on sustainable aquaculture culture and fisheries as critical solutions to ending hunger, malnutrition, and poverty, but also to leveraging progress on a number of other sustainable goals, such as life below water, climate change, gender equality, public health, justice, um, and reduced inequalities, responsible consumption, consumption and production, and so forth. Yet in some corners, it is argued that fish and aquatic foods, particularly in the developing world, remain largely overlooked in key policies, development programming, or private sector investments. 
So my question to you, Gareth, is um, why is that? And um, what do we need to do to ensure that food below water, to evoke a play on words from the Sustainable Development Goal 14, becomes part of this inclusive future of shared prosperity, human well-being, and a sustainable planet? Thank you. Thank you, Tana, for that question, which is uh, a vexing question for me uh, for many years uh, about the, uh, about the um, ability to centralised thinking around fish and aquatic foods and, and so on. Uh, thanks also to the World Economic Forum for, for hosting this and the opportunity for this side event. And um, so I think about answering that question, I, uh, sort of picking up on Jim's point there about details and, and the, the amount of data uh, and the critical gaps in knowledge that we have uh, in understanding aquatic foods and fish and their role in the future of food systems. Um, and this is one of the reasons why Wild Fish is collaborating with Jim and his team and Stanford University on the Blue Foods Assessment and why we've also contributed earlier to the um, Eat Lancet report and the outline of the role of aquatic foods on the path to sustainable and healthy diets. And as Wild Fish, uh, we collaborate across a lot of different organisations and FAO is obviously an important one, providing data and evidence to support and substantiate the importance of, of uh, fish and aquatic foods. Uh, we're working in a, a global study across uh, 52 countries, illuminating the hidden harvest of small-scale fisheries to national and global economies, and really important in terms of valuing or trying to evaluate the contribution of small-scale fisheries to food and nutrition security. Um, and there's also other reasons why perhaps the, the fisheries and aquaculture has been undervalued uh, is the misconceptions about aquatic food production. Some of those have been mentioned previously about uh, uh, these will drive biases in, in development policy and in programming. For example, many people think that aquaculture is just a large scale endeavor designed to meet the demands of export markets in the, uh, in the global north. But it, the research is telling us that in many developing countries, over 80% of the aquaculture production is consumed domestically. So it has an important contribution to food security and nutrition alongside fish that's caught in, in the wild. If you're talking about wild fisheries, many folk will say fisheries are in decline. There is nothing that can be done to save them. thus leading to it's an important sector to be largely overlooked and marginalised in policy processes and development interventions. And it's also assumed that we know everything about the value and contribution of fish and aquatic food to human, human nutrition. But actually, when you look at the data, the data says that most of the research uh, around uh, global nutrition data on fish, only 3% or a very small percentage comes from countries with low human development index, so developing countries. So we really not have enough information about the contribution of fish and aquatic resources to, to the nutrition in these countries. And also historically, uh, fish uh, and aquatic foods have been underinvested. And this is mainly because, and I think Marco was touching on, on some of this, we've traditionally been focused on agricultural research agenda, largely focused around um, land-based food production systems. But as the debate moves towards food systems and systems thinking and the interdisciplinary aspects of this and the holistic approaches, then we really have an important opportunity to rethink the future of food. Where does it come from? Where is food? How is it produced, distributed, consumed? Who benefits from it? How it impacts our environment? These are all important issues in terms of how it prepares and leaves us in terms of dealing with major climate events or global dis uh, disruptions like the current uh, pandemic on COVID-19. So really, we're in a situation now where we must link land and aquatic food production systems, examine the opportunities that this provides, the options and some of the trade-offs. And we, we need to do this in terms to enable a true food systems transformation towards healthy and sustainable diets. And that works for both people and our planet. So really, um, when we think about aquatic foods and the, and the, and the diversity and the benefits, uh, I think Jim mentioned 3 billion people rely on that. 1 billion of, of those rely for most of those animal proteins from fish and aquatic foods. 
And if you look at foresight analysis, some of the research we look at foresight, looking at the future and the global demand for fish and aquatic fuels, this will only increase, particularly as the populations, global population increases, urbanization. However, research uh, does indicate that if we manage well the resources and have technical innovations, the ocean could provide up to six times more food than it does today. When you think about that, that's almost two thirds of the animal protein required to feed the future global population. So significant contributions. Powerly fisheries and aquaculture are central to nutrition and livelihoods for more than 800 million people in developing countries, particularly those vulnerable to climate change, poverty, conflict, and humanitarian emergencies. It provides an important resource. And in, in this period now with COVID-19 and the pandemic, this is, a, this is an important resource for those people that are left vulnerable. And so the food and the oceans provide essential vitamins, micronutrients that are necessary, um, really not found in all other, uh, many other plant source foods or other animal source proteins. So aquatic foods can offer really important critical solutions for the more than 2 billion people globally will suffer the triple burden of malnutrition. So you can't underestimate and you cannot afford to ignore these facts if we are going to feed and nourish the nine billion people that will be estimated to be on Earth in 2050. So critically, fish and aquatic foods uh, must occupy, I believe, a central place in our food futures in the global agriculture research agenda alongside land-based crops and livestock. And really when I think about how we might do that, we need to mobilize <coughs> a global movement where research community, policy makers, donors, investors, business leaders, local producers, processors, traders, and consumers come together to create a shared value and co-design interventions that make aquatic foods an integral part of the food systems transformation agenda. So Tana, coming back to your second question about how we're going to make food below water part of a sustainable, inclusive future of shared prosperity for all and a healthy planet. I think there's three things that we need to accomplish. We've been touching on a little bit in the, in the, in the previous speakers, but we need to ensure that we have a sustainable production of a diversity of aquatic foods so that we can maximize uh, the impact uh, particularly in increasing our resilience and adaption to climate risk. And these are the, the kind of things we need to look at, are genetic improvements in, in programs, uh, management plans for preserving genetic resources for future farm species, <clears throat> climate smart aqu aquaculture, and better management of inland and coastal fisheries. We also do need to explore more uh, new aquatic foods, such as seaweeds, bivalves, and even synthetic uh, fish that it could be a disruptive technology for many markets in the South. And we need to reduce waste and loss in, in our seafood value chains. The second issue is that we need to ensure aquatic foods are affordable and accessible so that we can maximize social and economic impacts for shared prosperity and inclusive growth. We need to build the evidence for this, for inclusive policies and better decisions. It's important data collections we need to be able to break down some of the barriers in the market that impede access to, for, for inputs, to finance, to jobs, entrepreneurship opportunities, particularly for women and young people. We also need to work with industry and improve standards and develop innovative business models. We need to address key uh, justice and equity issues in the blue economy, in the blue sector. And we need to really think through the build public-private partnerships of shared values and impact. And last, the third thing I think is very important is we need to ensure aquatic foods are safe to eat and part of a solution to key nutrition and public health challenges. We need to work on the principles of One Health that recognises health as an integral part of the environment and the health of the animals. We must raise public and consumer awareness also towards healthy and sustainable diets that include aquatic foods. And probably most importantly, we need to prioritise the food and nutrition security needs of the poorest and the most vulnerable people, such as women, children, and those displaced by war, conflict, and climate change. And I suppose now we we're facing this looming food and social economic crisis triggered by the current COVID-19 pandemic. So really an essential ingredient in, uh, in addressing that issue and those that uh, face us as our populations grow. Back to you, Tana. 
Thanks, Gareth. I think that's a, that's a pretty sort of um, comprehensive answer, I guess, to that question. Um, and picking up actually on the point that you made about, you know, the urgency, I guess, to address food and socioeconomic crisis that's been brought on by COVID-19. I just, you know, wanted to sort of say that, yes, I mean, some people actually are arguing that, you know, especially in, in developing countries in Africa and Asia, uh, more, more people are likely to die from starvation um, as, a, as a result of the economic fallout from the pandemic, um, as opposed to dying from the disease itself. Um, and, and actually the COVID-19 pandemic is, has really exposed critical weaknesses in our food systems, which will be further exacerbated in the years to come by climate change and other factors. So I'm going to go um, over to Tony Cavalieri, um, a representative of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who are actually one of the strongest supporters of the in international agriculture research agenda and have made significant um, investments in CJR and sort of, um, and, and who obviously have also experience with um, the private sector to sort of ask the question, how can, you know, public and private actors come together to build back better the kind of future food systems that are sustainable, resilient and inclusive to deal with situations like we're facing now? Uh, thank you, Tana. Um, I've, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for including me on this panel and um, and I'm happy to be here today. I, um, I think uh, that most people know that the Gates Foundation is um, active in, in agricultural development. We've been working in this area for a little over 10 years. Um, although the Gates Foundation is a relatively new donor to the aquaculture and aquatic foods um, sector, but we recognize the importance of, of these areas for livelihoods and for nutrition, and particularly in our geographies where we concentrate our, ag, our, our work in this area in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, so it's uh, it is coming on uh, onto our radar more strongly, and we're thinking about how to do this. We've been highly motivated by trying to have impact on the ground, and um, that's always a challenge with with research organizations, um, even applied research organizations, in that it's relatively easy to fund research to get good uh, scientific output and papers. It's it's somewhat more difficult to have that work impact uh, farmers, uh, producers, small scale producers and others on the ground. And so that has been an ongoing challenge of ours, particularly um, when it comes to the products of genetic improvement in crops or, or um, in livestock and um, in getting information to farmers or, or other producers. So we're, we're highly motivated by seeing those impacts. Um, and, you know, we, we understand that, that the supply of fish and aquatic foods from aquaculture and from um, fisheries are really complementary and, and have important potential to improve the income and nutrition of the poor if we can get those to, um, to those groups. And, um, and we've tried to do that um, through uh, collaborations between uh, the researchers that we fund and the research organizations and particularly the private sector, because we believe the private sector is inherently sustainable and that they can fund their own um, activities ongoing and aren't subject to donors or um, country budgets. And so um, this is a critical tie for us. And, and we're not really talking necessarily about multinationals, although sometimes they play a role, but to the, to the smaller companies and um, the ones who get uh, the results of the research, the last mile from um, from the researchers to the to the people in the field. So we're we're very much in a learning uh, phase in aquaculture and aquatic foods. We made our first grant to uh, World Fish in 2018. Um, and so along with the rest of CGIAR, World Fish is an important partner for us in, in uh, carrying out this work. And we're, we're really considering whether we would open up more funding 
uh, for investment in, in this area in the future. And, and that's highly dependent on a number of things. And, um, you know, primarily, is there a path to small scale producers, uh, whether that's uh, fish, of livestock, of crops, um, that we can count on so that our funding will result in change in people's lives. And so that's, I think, where uh, um, the innovative ideas about how the, the public sector works with the private sector and with uh, companies can come in important. As far as our, our criteria, we're really wondering, you know, can aquaculture and aquatic foods uh, impact our, our high level impact goals? And those are increasing small scale producers productivity and income. And um, in addition to increasing nutrition and um, also contributing to women's empowerment. And I think that's, um, you know, the important component of the, the, what will be pretty inevitable growth in this sector. But the question for us is, will it be, um, will it, increase productivity, but more importantly, will it increase nutrition sensitive production systems? Will it contribute to nutrition overall? And will it really uh, be equitable in a way that it impacts um, women's livelihoods along the value chain? And, and I think there are really difficult questions about how that that might happen. And finally, we think about how we can use our comparative advantage in leveraging the relationship between the private sector and aligning the country development goals to uh, help solve and, and challenge these bottlenecks. So we're, we're very excited to have a partner like World Fish that can work along the the value chain and has taken these kind of innovative approaches. So uh, just to repeat, we're, we're a bit new here. We're certainly still learning. We have some experience to uh, bring from other parts of our agricultural program in the way public private partnerships can work with, uh, with appropriate encouragement and, and occasional funding. So um, that's sort of our perspective on, on the area at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. I think you're hanging with the right crowd because some of the questions that you raise are also um, the kind of questions that, you know, a lot of the scientists that I also work with, you know, have and constantly grapple with. Um, so I guess a, a general question to all the panel members is, is really, I guess, in this new reality that we live in, uh, do we need to do anything better or differently in terms of how we connect communities and drive con concrete actions and innovation in the land and ocean space to ensure that billions of people are fed and nourished and human and planetary health is secured for generations to come. But I will let you ponder a little bit on that question and I'm just gonna monitor the little bit the chat and sort of see if there is some questions. Um, and yes, we have Eddie. So a couple questions from Eddie Ellison and I'm just gonna bring you um, into the conversation, Eddie, to like ask those questions yourself or make those comments. Hi, Eddie uh, Ellison from uh, recently World Fish. I'm going to have to move because um, there are two of us on web conferences in the same room. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a, a question for um, Marco on the CG um, reform process. Um, I'm excited that it's driven by this need for systems thinking. Um, but also have a concern, I think, that many of the social scientists in the CG perhaps share that in adopting this sort of large scale systems approach, we lose the kind of analysis of, of um, all the, um, the sort of more uh, politicized and socially differentiated parts of um, social research and, and figuring out how a big systemic change impacts small scale um, resource poor farmers uh, entrepreneurial women in fish value chains and so on. How's, how's the CG going to organize to ensure that that kind of research carries on when it's in this sort of large harmonized uh, systems orientated mode? Shall I react to this, Tana? 
Or do you of want course. to? Collect? Yes, we want to have this as a conversation. Well, let, me, let me be brief in the interest of time, but I, I'm really uh, pleased, uh, um, um, Eddie, for for, for 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 you to ask this question, right? But the answer is, and and I'm not going to say that this is that that, that you're raising an easy problem, you're actually raising a difficult problem, difficult uh, from a management perspective, from a, from a conceptual problem identification and understanding problem. Um, and, uh, and, and, and also institutional issues are playing into, into this thing in terms of how we, how we, how we get um, um, assessed and, and approached. But so basically you're saying big systems thinking that doesn't, big systems thinking, okay, that doesn't take into account how things really pan out on the ground in terms of their distributional consequences, for example, um, and can really therefore create um, unintended consequences which are at odds with the rhetorically invoked um, objectives of the particular of the particular venture yes that can happen so but i'm but but the answer is that we must allocate systems thinking at the right level some of it will be in terms of big picture uh, connections other aspects of it will be in terms of the connection of many small connectables dimensions of a particular problem that play into uh, an approach uh, at, that is geared to solving a certain problem that must take into account the effects on, on, on the environment locally, for example, it must take into account effects on, on the people involved, the operators involved, whether they be small producers, whether they be women, youth, uh, and, and, and so on. And, and answer, uh, ask and answer the question in terms of the design of the work and the, and the, and the, and the agreements uh, between the partners that work on, on, these, on, on, on these programs that, for example, are, have the purpose of progressing CGIR developed solutions to users to make sure that the above is taken into account, that we do not create more inequities, uh, mm -hmm. but rather uh, uh, stay true to the objectives that we, that, that, we all, that we all share. For example, when it comes to poverty reduction, gender equity, youth employment generation, um, value generation at the level of local communities that benefit local communities and so on. So are there any other panel members that want to tackle Eddie's question? Well, let me just say a little bit about it, I say with some um, hesitation. So Eddie, because in your written question, you also flagged the question of how does this get addressed in the Blue Food Assessment? And there's a, I'm tempted to go with a short answer to that, which is that you are at the center of the Blue Food Assessment. So we're relying on you to bring um, this <laughs> perspective into the, into the fold into the mix, but but to be serious, right? I mean, Ros Naylor and Bea Krona, the co-chairs, are both deeply committed to being um, thoughtful about the concerns that you're raising. Uh, Christina Hicks and Jessica Gephardt are leading a paper that's very much focused on justice and equity in crafting solutions. Um, and I, in addressing these issues, and, and I think that it's both gonna be for us vitally a matter of making sure that the science that's done illuminates the, the dynamics that you're talking about and the diversity that you're talking about. But secondly, and this is some, an area where I would love to be working together with you, is that we are thoughtful about how we translate that science into a form that can be used by decision makers at multiple levels and that, that helps diverse local communities um, address the challenges and opportunities they face while also enabling us collectively to address the global forces or dynamics that buffet those communities and, and actually shape some of the challenges and opportunities they face. Um, and it would be, we have the luxury of a year um, between, but before we get to the food summit and maybe longer uh, in a COVID postponement era. Um, and it would be great to be thinking about, you know, how do we do that well and, and, and develop something that really is powerfully useful to a diverse set of decision makers whose choices actually shape the future. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think Ed has mentioned also a question and I think that is directed to uh, Tony with regards to, uh, or, and, and Gates Foundation's aquaculture agenda in terms of how will impacts be measured and are there any baselines and counterfactuals to draw upon? So how, what's the thinking, you know, at the Gates Foundation at the moment in that regard? Yeah, 
<clears throat> and I might come in a, a little more generally since I'm not the expert in aquaculture, but um, obviously one of the things that we think a lot about and are targeting our work toward is is um, inclusive agricultural transformation um, within the countries that we work in. And so, you know, not just, you know, and although it's very important, our, our smallholders and, and small scale producers, incomes increased and are they increased in an equitable way. But this is this contributing to agriculture and economic, um, and in this case, I include um, aquaculture with agriculture, um, you know, contributing to the the transformation of the economies in those countries. Um, and, um, you know, that's tied to incomes, uh, obviously, uh, on a on a lower level scale, measuring incomes, um, and measuring the benefits of, of um, the innovations to individual small scale producers is is really important um, doing that in a way that's disaggregated for men and women so we can tell what the the real effect is across the board is important the other the other thing i maybe bring from some of our other experiences um it if if you're working in some of the areas like genetic improvement of of um, fish, there are good metrics um, for the effectiveness of the, those programs in terms of genetic gain for the traits that you care about. And there are quite good ways of, of measuring um, the adoption of those improved varieties and, and species to different, um, you know, by different uh, producers and, and aquaculture producers. And, and so I think we get, we feel like we have some of the, um, some of the metrics we need, obviously that's, that's evolving and um, our, our, our use of those metrics are kind of focused in our one investment in with world fish, but we would, we would hope to take a broader version of, or a broader vision of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks. Um, thanks, Tony. Um, so there's another question um, that's coming here uh, about what are some of the priorities of aquatic food value chains post COVID-19? And maybe I'm just going to press Gareth a little bit here um, in terms of like, what's, um, you know, what's, what's World Fish doing differently? Um, and then in terms of kind of understanding what the situation in the ground in the short term, but also in the long term. Thanks, Tan. I was actually interested in listing some of those responses uh, to those questions. But yeah, um, with COVID, I mean, obviously at the moment, the short term, uh, short term work that we're doing is to try and understand and build up the knowledge around the supply chain. So there's quite a lot of work that we're doing, which you can access uh, actually through through our website. Uh, um, is to look at how uh, countries that we're working across in Africa, Asia, and, and uh, the Pacific are responding. And, and, and have reacted to the COVID crisis in terms of uh, getting the food from the from the producers, from the from the fishers and the producers to the consumers. And there's been some quite innovative ways that's happening, but also <clears throat> the data that's been generated through 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 a lot of virtual and remote way uh, data collection has been quite valuable and shared with government. And, and looking at different ways of which you know changes can be can be developed. And one of the things <clears throat> I think could be interesting. In the long term, and I was thinking about your question about, you know, the impacts of of COVID, but also how we change change the delivery of of, uh, of fish and aquatic foods. Uh, we have been investing some time and energy into an innovation hub a process in, in in Africa, looking at fish uh, fish for uh, Africa innovation hub, uh, looking at Egypt, but also a network of hubs across uh, Africa where. You can come together with it, sort of looking at the, um, the research, looking at the, uh, the policies, but also connecting with business in this uh, both the physical and virtual space that uh, can allow <coughs> the distribution of uh, of innovations and obviously that uh, with foods into the into the supply chain. I think those are the sort of longer term solutions where we're sort of thinking. You know, the COVID <clears throat> investment in, in food and food systems is really investment in COVID-19 in terms of improving the, the health and the nutrition and, uh, of people uh, and having that accessibility and affordable nutritious food. So 
we think those sort of longer term uh, aspects which can connect with the CGIR's work uh, of how to get those innovations into those communities using these sort of you know, the, the mix of public and private sector is really an important area that, that you know is emerging from this and I think it'll be a different different way of which we operate and hopefully making making impacts with the billions you know feeding the millions but it's actually impacting the billions and it's, that's the challenges that we have and I think Pratic Foods has that ability to, to do that. Thanks, Gareth. I think we have time for one more question, which I'm going to try and summarize from several questions that have come um, sort of to my tray. Um, and and so sort of it's a kind of nice segue into what you were talking about, you know, building this innovation hub in, in, in Africa. Um, so the question is really around sort of what, what are some of the things that can be done to sort of really leverage the potential of aquaculture and small scale fisheries to achieve progress on sustainable development goals in this region. Um, so any of, of the members of the panel, so it's, it's really about sort of how we make sort of aquatic foods part of that solution for, for, the, for the continent. Can I say something and I'll be very brief. Um, um, of course. Uh, because, uh, so first of all, there's a huge amount of underinformation and misinformation with respect to, this, to the potential of ocean-based and, and aquatic, uh, uh, aquaculture-based food. And I think we need to do something about this. And that passes through many of the interventions that several panelists, in particular Jim and, uh, and Gareth, has specifically addressed this. We need to do a lot more uh, 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 about this. However, at the same time, uh, evidence-based advocacy and communications are not going to be enough. We need to give more examples, and that and that's where we need to think, like in terms of economic development and what what makes economies tick. And the advantage here is that seafood and fish are cash crops. And so, in the context of the agricultural transformation that, for example, Tony has referred to, the ag transformation is all about moving people out of agriculture into productive jobs. Some of them could be, must be, will be in cash crops that are more highly remunerative than than, than than other types of productive endeavors in agriculture and food systems more broadly. So there is huge potential here. So we need to think about what are the, the technological solutions and what are the, the partnership building solutions that we need in order for those value chains to, to come about uh, in ways that, and this goes back to Eddie's question, in ways that create remunerative employment for people. Thanks, uh, Marco. Well, unfortunately, I, I know we could, you know, carry on having this conversation for like another hour and more, but we have come to the close of our session. So let me close this by thanking all of you panel members for this fruitful and timely discussion, um, as well as all the attendees and participants who've chosen to follow us today in this deep dive. I hope you've enjoyed the exchange of views and perspectives on this crucial importance of building a more holistic agriculture research agenda that pays greater attention to the linkages between land and water food production systems. Um, our panel members have helped us highlight the unique role and the unlocked potential of aquatic foods alongside um, land-based crops and livestock for addressing these critical challenges um, that we face particularly in the context of COVID. Um, and we've also heard, you know, how this greater focus on aquatic foods, but all, as well as innovative approaches to public and private partnerships and research collaboration is crucial um, and, and urgently needed to mitigate um, the impact on, on people, planet and our food systems. So we hope you have been inspired and taken something useful from this discussion to apply to your everyday work research or individual and collective action for shaping positive change in the world through um, food from the ocean. So I wish you all a wonderful day and this um, event is now adjourned. Thank you.